This is a start of a three-part series on where we implement combat. Okay, it's a bit of a stretch to call it that, but if you're lost and don't know where to start, this will put you on the right track. In this particular video, we'll start off by tackling lock-on. This is where the camera tracks the target and the player turns to face and strafes around them. Some notable examples of this style would be Dark Souls, Legend of Zelda, and For Honor. This project will be adapting and expanding on strafing. If you haven't seen it already, give it a watch and get caught up. Before we get into it, there are two bugs I want to fix. If you follow the camera controller video, you may have noticed that sometimes the character spins without input. This happens when something collides with the player and causes torque, creating angular velocity. I previously said not to freeze the Y rotation, but you actually do want to do that, so go ahead and check that box. The second issue is that the framing is applied in world space. What we actually want is the framing to be local, where the X value means moving to the right of the follow transform and not moving along the world X axes. To do this, we just have to pass the framing into transform direction and add the resulting vector to the follow transform's position. We use this transform direction as it ignores the transform's position and scale. With those taken care of, let's get started. Our current strafing animations are fairly generic, and I'm going to change them to suit the context of boxing. I'm going to import 5 new animations, boxing idle, boxing walk back, boxing walk forward, boxing walk left, and boxing walk right. All of these can be found on Mixamo, and I'll leave their names in the description. As usual, I'll set the animation type to humanoid, avatar definition to copy from other avatar, source to xbot avatar, and apply that. Then, in each of the animations, I'll set loop time, loop pose, transform rotation, bake into pose based upon original, transform position y, bake into pose based upon feet, transform position xz, bake into pose if it's the idle animation, and based upon original. Now, in the blend tree of our animator controller, we're going to replace our strafing motions with the new boxing ones. Moving down the list, standing walk forward becomes boxing walk forward, standing walk back becomes boxing walk back, standing idle becomes boxing idle, standing walk right becomes boxing walk right, and standing walk left becomes boxing walk left. Alright, let's see what it looks like in scene. Admittedly, it doesn't look the greatest, but you work with what you have, and for the few minutes it took, it's not bad. Of course, for your own game, you'll use animations that are more suitable, and you can polish it to your heart's content. With the animations done, I'm going to rename aim to lock on inside the player inputs. This will reset the value, so make sure you set it back in the scene. Now in the camera controller, we'll start by creating a bool to hold if we're locked on or not, and a transform to represent what we're locking onto. What you could do is set the camera's rotation to the quaternion.luck rotation using the vector between the camera and the target. However, the problem with this is that it breaks the relationship between the rotation, planar direction, and the target vertical angle, both of which are used in other calculations. Normally, the camera's rotation is constructed using the planar direction and the target vertical angle, so what I'm going to do will feel weird, but it'll preserve the continuity. If we're locked on and there is a target, I'll calculate the vector from the camera to the target by subtracting the camera's position from the target's position. Then, I'll get only the XZ portion by projecting it onto the plane defined by vector.up. Now, we'll update the planar direction with the normalized planar cam to target as long as it doesn't equal vector 3.0, otherwise it will remain what it was. This retains the properties of the planar direction of always being a value that's not 0 and having a magnitude of 1. The target distance remains the same, but the target vertical angle needs to change. We'll bring back the luck rotation from earlier and substitute the first argument of the clamp function to be the luck rotation's Euler angle dot x. Essentially, what we have done is taken the luck rotation, deconstructed it into its two parts, for it to be reconstructed later. This is to preserve the planar direction and target angle for other calculations, as well as preventing going in and out of lock on being disjointed. Now, we need a way to actually toggle lock on. For that, let's make a public function that takes in the desired value. If the desired value is the same as the current value, we'll early out. Otherwise, we'll invert the lock on. 
Of course, the function needs to be called somewhere, so let's go to the character controller and I'm just going to tack it onto the bottom of the update function. If inputs.lockon.pressdown, then we'll call the function with the opposite value of what lockon currently is. Here, I'll quickly make a public property in the camera control to access it and the target. Since we adapted this from strafing, this section where sprinting and strafing is determined needs to be changed. Strafing is equal to the lock-on and sprinting stays the same. And if we're sprinting, we'll toggle the lock-on to false. This will retain the interaction where strafing cancels sprinting and vice versa. Next, we have to update the strafing rotation of the character. Similar to the camera, we'll calculate the vector between the character and the target, then projecting it onto the XZ plane and passing it into quaternion.look rotation. To test this, I'll place an XBOT model into the scene and reference it as the target of the camera controller. Pressing lock on, the camera snaps to tracking the target and our character becomes ready to rumble, putting up their fists and turning to face their opponent. If you haven't noticed, when we lock on, we're locking on to the model's feet, or its origin. In this case, it should be about chest height. To do that, I'll be creating an interface. Let's create a new c -sharp script, I targetable. If you don't know, interfaces are kind of like a guarantee, usually compared to a contract. If a class implements an interface, it is guaranteed to have the properties and methods of the interface. Hopefully, it will become more apparent as we continue forward. Anyways, iTargetable is an interface and does not inherit from mono behavior. The only things it will have is a public bool, targetable, which determines if it can be targeted, and a public transform, target transform, which is what the camera will actually be tracking. So anything that implements iTargetable is guaranteed to have both targetable and target transform, regardless if it's an orc, an imp, dragon, or otherwise. Another issue is that you don't know your target beforehand, or if it even exists, meaning we can't reference it during development as we have done so far. Therefore, our next step is to implement target acquisition. These two will no longer be serialized, and I'll add some variables for acquiring a target. A locked on distance, the maximum distance a potential target can be, and locked on layers, the layers to search within. Additionally, target is no longer a transform, but rather an eye targetable. And in the character controller, this will be the target's target transform. Same with this line in the camera controller. Continuing on, if we want to lock on, I'll create a list of targetables to represent all eligible targets. Then I'll create an array of colliders to hold all the colliders detected by physics.overlap sphere using the transforms position, the lock on distance, and the lock on layers. Next, we need to iterate through all the colliders and use get component with a type of eye targetable. If you didn't know, get component can be used with interfaces just as it is with classes. If targetable is not null, if targetable.targetable is true, if targetable is in the screen, and if targetable is not blocked then we'll add it to the list of eligible targets. Next, of course, we need to define these functions. Private bool in screen takes an eye targetable. I'll use world to viewport point to convert the eye targetable's position into viewport space, which is normalized with the bottom left of the screen being 0, 0 and the top right as 1, 1. If the viewport point is too far to the left or right, return false. If the viewport point is too far below or above, return false. And if the viewport is behind the camera, return false. Otherwise, return true. Yes, the targetable is in the screen. Then we have private bool not blocked, which takes an eye targetable. And to determine if it's blocked or not, we'll use a sphere cast. The origin is the camera's transform position. The direction is the vector from the origin to the target transform position. The radius is an arbitrary 0.15, the larger it is, the easier it is to be obstructed. The distance is the magnitude of the direction vector. And lastly, I'll reuse the obstruction layers as the layer to check against. You can use another layer mass if you need to. While I'm here, I'll create a private bool in distance function which takes an eye targetable. It returns the result of the distance between the character's position and the targetable's position less than or equal to the lock on distance. We don't need it just yet, as the overlap sphere, for the most part, takes into account the distance, but I'll touch more on this later. Now that we've filtered out all the eligible targets, we need to find the one that is closest to the center of the screen. 
Hypotenuse represents the distance from the screen center to the current target's screen space position. Smallest distance is the current smallest hypotenuse, and closest targetable is the targetable who is represented by the smallest distance. We'll use a for each and iterate through all the targetables, calculate its distance from center, and if it's less than the smallest hypotenuse, we'll update it and the closest targetable. Calculate hypotenuse returns a float and takes in a vector 3. To get the screen center, we'll take the camera's pixel width and height and divide by 2. Then, to get the screen position, we'll use camera.world to screen point, passing in position. This differs from world to viewport point as it isn't normalized. Next, we calculate the difference between the screen position and the screen center, and using good old Pythagoras, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, we calculate the hypotenuse. Finally, we can set the target and lock on to true if the target's not null. Now that we can acquire a target, but the problem is that there's nothing that's targetable, so let's make a new test targetable class. This test targetable class inherits from mono behavior and it implements the iTargetable interface as well. I'll implement this explicitly and use serialized backing fields so I can set them in the inspector. Now, if our test targetable is treated as an I targetable, both the targetable and target transform property is guaranteed to exist for other scripts to use. In the scene, I'll add test targetable to our target, then creating an empty, placing it around neck height and referencing it as the target transform. Additionally, I'll add a capsule collider to be detected by our overlap sphere. In the camera controller, I'll just set it to look in the default layer and make sure that the target's also in that layer. Testing this now, you'll see that it doesn't work. That's because in the in-screen function, I referenced the member variable and not the local one that's passed in. And the obstructions layer includes the default layer, meaning that the target will obstruct itself. To get around this, let's add a new terrain layer and set the obstruction layer to only be terrain. Then I'll move the level game object and its children into that layer. And I'll make a terrain wall to place our targets behind to test obstructing. Finally, we can see it working. The targets must be within the screen and not obscured, and we lock onto the one that's closest to the center. As you can see, this method of target acquisition has its shortcomings. Some issues are that the targetables need to be on specific layers, which might interfere with other mechanics of your game, and they require a collider which adds extra overhead and clutters your game objects. A solution to this may be to use a running list implemented through a singleton or a scriptable object, but that's for another time. In the testing, we see that if the target is not obstructed at the time of acquisition, the player stays locked on even if they are obstructed later. To complement acquiring a target, we must also be able to lose a target. I'll add a new serialized float, lock on lost time, which represents how long a target can be invalid until it's lost, and a variable to track how long it has been. If lock on is true and target is not null, we'll check its validity. If it's still targetable, in distance, in the screen, and not blocked. If it's valid, we'll reset the current time to zero. Otherwise, it'll accumulate the time.delta time clamp between zero and the lost time. And if the current time reaches the maximum, lock on will be set to false. Testing it in the scene, we can confirm that after a second of not being targetable, obstructed, or out of range, we lose our lock. Now that we have acquiring lock on and losing lock on, let's add a bit of polish by adjusting the framing and field of view. I'll add a serialized vector 3 to represent the lock on framing and a serialized float for the lock on field of view. We also need a variable to hold what the FOV normally is, and a variable to hold the interpolation between not locked on and locked on. Then I'll rename framing to framing normal, and when you rename a variable, its value is reset, so be sure to set it back. In start, I'll assign the FOV normal to the camera's current FOV, and in the update, I'll create a new vector 3 called framing that is the lerp between framing normal and locked on framing using the framing lerp. Then we'll use this new framing and replace framing normal in the focus position calculation. Similarly, the FOV is the lerp between the FOV normal and the lock on FOV, using the framing lerp so they interpolate at the same rate. This value gets assigned back into the camera's field of view. Now we need to actually determine what the framing lerp is. If we are locked on, it'll be itself incremented by time.delta time multiplied by an arbitrary 4. This is so it takes a quarter of a second to fully transition and all that clamp between 0 and 1. 
If we aren't locked on, it'll decrement instead, and that should be all for scripting. Back in the scene, I'll set the lock on framing to 0 0.4, 0 0.4, and the FOV to 20. With that framing, the character doesn't block the target and the FOV really focuses in. This is doubly useful if your game has aspects of stealth or assassination. The narrower field of view makes it easier to sneak up on them if they're in combat and locked on. An example of this is Hood Outlaws and Legends. To recap, we implemented lock on behavior for both the camera and the character controller, created an interface to generically handle what is targetable, implemented target acquisition and losing lock on, and we applied a bit of polish. As always, I encourage you to take this, improve it, and truly make it your own. Some ideas to take you beyond this video is implementing target switching, making the target be within a threshold instead of always being in the center of the screen, improved target acquisition discussed earlier, and creating a UI indicator. That's all for me folks, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.